All right, so we're going to start with chapter 12. This is uh, itemized deductions part two. So we've kind of, we're still on the schedule A, um, but we're going to go down to the bottom. We've talked about the medical. We've talked about taxes you paid, interest you've paid, gifts to charity. Now what we're going to talk about is the bottom sections down here. So we're going to talk about casualty and theft losses, job expenses, okay, and other miscellaneous deductions. What happens on a lot of the, the uh, itemized deductions at the bottom of the Schedule A is a lot of them have thresholds, kind of like the medical. So a lot of it, the first percentage is excluded, okay? So that's why we broke it up into two separate parts here, okay? So as you can see at the bottom 12.3, we have, uh, we identify the casualty theft loss, um, and we'll use that form 4684, okay. Um, we'll talk a little bit about net operating loss, but we're not gonna get caught up on that one. Um, we'll talk about business expenses, the 2106, uh, work-related education expenses, We'll talk about mis miscellaneous deductions that are subject to a 2% threshold, and then miscellaneous deductions that are not subject to the 2%, okay? All right, and then the overall itemized deduction limit, which you don't see anybody get to very often, all right? Okay, all right, so on 12-4, casualties and theft losses. Um, there's several publications that relate to this um, with different things that can happen to somebody that they would be able to itemize. Um, down at the bottom of 12.4, it talks about a casualty is the damage, destruction, or loss of property resulting from an identifiable event that is sudden, unexpected, or unusual, okay? So, I think they're basically talking about acts of God, all right? Uh, deductible losses include car accidents, earthquakes, fires, floods, demolition um, by the government, okay? Um, mine cave-ins, shipwrecks, sonic booms, storms, terrorist attacks, vandalism, and volcanic eruptions, okay? I would classify most of those as unexpected, all right? Unless you can tell me that there's something that's going to be happening very soon, all right? Um, the thing about casualty and theft losses is it does not come into play very often, all right? What, uh, what we have on there is most of this is um, covered by insurance. Okay, because just like what we had for the medical, if anything is reimbursed, we don't get to claim it as a loss. All right. Okay. Um, theft, the theft is the taking or removing of money or property with the intent to deprive the owner of it. And that's a pretty good definition of theft, okay. Uh, taking a property must be illegal under the law of the state where it has occurred and it must have been done with criminal intent but you do not need to convict the criminal, okay? All right. Um, Ponzi-type investment schemes. Nobody's been a victim of a Ponzi scheme in here, have they? Okay. Um, talks about those. And loss on deposits can occur when a bank, credit union, or other financial institution becomes insolvent or bankrupt. I imagine this goes back to the depression and the run on the banks that it's in there, okay? We don't really see, oh, well, I guess, what was it, the 80s with the savings and loans, too. So that would have been more so with those, okay? Uh, let's see here. Down on the bottom of 12.6, proof of loss. To deduct a casualty or theft loss, the taxpayer must be able to prove that they had a casualty or theft. They must be able to support the amount taken as a deduction, okay? All right.
and it talks on both of them about a claim for reimbursement, which would be more so the insurance, okay? So on this line, you can see the 4684, all right? So we're gonna kind of use it to kind of go through some of these. Okay, so we talk about the personal property, something that happened to a personal property of ours. You know, we could have um, October storm, um, you know, the roof collapses, things like that. But again, when we get into this, as you can see here, we have the cost or other basis of each property. Okay, so what do we have into it? All right. Chances are that cost or other basis, when we've reported and have it done and a receipt for it, what's the insurance gonna do? It's gonna reimburse us for that value, all right? If the insurance does not reimburse us, then we have a chance to do this claim. But, <laughs> we have to exceed 10% of our AGI for it to count, okay? All right, so that's one of the drawbacks on this with the theft or loss, okay? You can put it on there. All right. So you can put it on there, but like I said, most of the time. I think I've done, well, for some reason I had two, two years ago in Lockport, there were house fires. And because of uh, the insurance did not cover and the person had uh, some inventory of some things that were in there that were of value that the insurance did not reimburse for because for some reason, I don't know why, that they weren't part of the insurance. So we were able to do some things with that Okay, where we had the, the uh, insurance that exceeded the, the 10%, okay? But, again, everything has to be over and above what's reimbursed by insurance, okay? All right. Uh, let's see here. I don't want to get too hung up on this because it doesn't come into play a lot. Okay. Uh, talks a little bit on the bottom of, on page 12.9, it talks a little bit about if you have a home business, so business or income producing property, um, if you have that. Uh, the other thing you have to take into account, you can see there, it says the adjusted basis in the property minus any salvage value, okay? Um, I know one fire, the gentleman had a tractor in his garage, but he was able to salvage it for something, so we had to adjust what we could claim on there over and above the insurance, okay? All right. Okay. All right, and 1210 at the top is a perfect little chart that talks about the application of the loss, okay? So you can see that it has the 100% rule, then it has that 10% rule I just talked about, and then has the 10%, or excuse me, 2% rule um, for anything that you have that is business related, okay? Okay. Yes. Do you know what the, um, the, the basis for what the reason for um, right the first time says you must reduce each casualty of that loss by $100? Why? What, do you know where that came from? Or what, why that? I think they're just using it from an insurance term like a deductible. Oh, I suppose. Yeah. Even though you may not have a deductible, they've kind of 
integrated one into the calculation on the form that says that you know there's a hundred percent hundred dollar deductible that you'd have to pay anyway okay all right okay so let's go to page because I don't want to get hung up on the casualty loss and stuff we don't have a lot of those and we don't really have any on the business set either on the form 4794 okay all right and and I'm not going to do net operating loss because we haven't discussed the form 1045 at all okay so it doesn't make much sense that I throw a net operating loss at you when you don't understand how we came up with the net operating loss, okay, from the, the form 1045, okay? Boy, wait till I get a hold of Mark on that one. I guess I'm supposed to teach you how to do a 1045. If you have any real tough questions on this one, you can just call President-elect Trump because he uses this one quite often. Okay? All right. Okay? All right. And if you're real nice to him, he might make you a member of his cabinet. Okay. Now, we're going to get into the one that we see more of, and this is on 1217 where we get into employee business expenses. Okay? What I want you to remember on this section is when we talk about employee business expenses, we're talking about a W-2 employee, okay? If we're self-employed, these expenses would show up on a Schedule C because we'd be 1099 or we would be having um, our own records of what our income or receipts are, okay? So this one is much more related to a W-2 employee. Tough thing about W-2 employees, most of the time what happens? They have what as part of their compensation package? You know, if they have a job where they're doing miles, chances are they're going to get miles. Okay? If they have a cell phone that they're using for business, chances are, because with a W-2 employee, what's that employer probably doing with that expense of paying that for them? They're writing it off against their profits in their business. Okay? So, again, always think of unreimbursed. Okay? Because as it says... On line 21, unreimbursed and employee expenses, job, travel, union jobs, job education, etc. Okay? So it says it right there on the on the, the form. Okay. The other thing is you get introduced to the words ordinary and necessary. Okay. They love these terms for the schedule C for mileage and things like that. The IRS loves the terms ordinary and necessary all right ordinary expense is one that is common and accepted in a trade or business all right so I guess if you're a saying that you're a lumberjack and you're writing off delivering cupcakes okay chances are that's not ordinary to be in a lumberjack is having anything to do with cupcakes okay Necessary expense is one that is helpful and appropriate for the business. Okay. All right. My lumberjack, I would say sharpening his axes is appropriate. Okay. For his business. All right. Okay. I can't think of, I don't know if I want to think of anything inappropriate for a lumberjack that is not necessary expenses, but we have to have those. And again, unreimbursed. Okay. Now, we're going to talk about the Form 2106 and the 2106-EZ, all right? If we go, you can see right here in line 21, if I go into my little link and I go in there, I have two forms, okay? We'll start with the 2106-EZ, and this is where we'll kind of talk about the expenses that are in there, all right? As it says at the top, you, get, uh, you are an employee deducting ordinary and necessary expenses. You do not get reimbursed by your employer for any expenses, and you are using standard mileage rate for vehicle expenses claimed. 
You can use the standard mileage rate only if you own the vehicle and use the standard mileage rate for the first year you placed in service, or you lease the vehicle and use its standard mileage rate for a portion of lease prior to after 1997, okay? Anytime you do uh, mileage versus actual expenses for a car, whatever you did the first year, you have to stay with it. You can't decide which one's best, okay? All right. So you can see on this one, we're on the 1040, e, or excuse me, 2106EZ, okay? Vehicle expenses using the standard rate. Now, my wife works for a marketing company, all right? She gets paid 33 cents a mile by the company. Anybody know what the rate is for mileage? 57. Oh, 57. 2015 is 57. Oh, yeah, 57. Is that right? I hate when I'm not teaching the year that I'm in. <laughs> yes, 57 and a half. Okay. So she gets reimbursed at 33 cents a mile. Can I claim that 33 cents a mile? Nope. Well, how, can I claim 57 and a half? What about the difference between the two? Yes. <laughs> Okay, because I'm not reimbursed for that. So she can do the mileage there. Uh, parkings, fees, tolls, transportation, including trains, bus, that do not involve overnight travel or commuting to and from to work. If you live in New York City, just because you take the subway back and forth to work, that is not a job expense. Now, if I live in New York City and I take the subway to my original, from my home, to my place of work, and then from there, I'm going out to make sales calls that I'm not reimbursed for. Can I take the train then? Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. We'll kind of get in there. I think in this chapter, they have the fun little wheel thing on there. Uh, travel expenses while away from home overnight, including lodging, airplane, car rental. Do not include meals and entertainment. Okay. Because that's on the next line. All right. Meals and entertainment. The IRS has determined that every human being needs to eat. Okay? All right? They do not figure that while you're working that you are fasting. Okay? So, that being said, when you have business expenses for food, you can only take half or whatever is not yours if you're doing it for business sake. So, if I take Tim out for a steak dinner and we discuss business and I pay for it, all right. Are you a steak eater? No. Or do we go for pizza? Okay. We went out for pizza. All right. If I buy the pizza, I can only write off half. Okay. Only half of it because of what I paid for him. The IRS has determined the other half of the pizza I needed to eat to survive. Okay. Um. Now, down here, there are some things that talks about employees subject to Department of Transportation hours of service, limits, meal expenses, okay? That would be for somebody that is an over-the-road truck, okay? Um, there's what's called a per diem for the days out, all right? So if you have an over-the-road trucker that's living in their little tractor-trailer type thing, they get a per diem. The per diems are all listed. And the um, So, if I'm out, and this is based on 2014-15, and I am an over-the-road trucker, um, this is what meals and incidental expenses at per diem rate. So, if I'm away from home overnight, if I'm in Buffalo, I would get $64. New York City, I get $74. Syracuse, I get $59. Rochester, I would get $59. Okay. 
All right. And based on what that is, is it's based on the expenses of being in that area for you to be there. Okay, so truckers get over the road. So sometimes we have a trucker that come in with their log books. You see how many nights they're out, you know, maybe 200 of the year. And obviously if it's log books, we could spend hours charting every city that they're in, okay? But the IRS has a simplified method that you can do, which is a high low per diem. And for that, effective until, I'm gonna get a new one here. All right. Their high low per diem is based on that, is 68. No, excuse me. In the United States, we're doing $63, okay? So that's basically saying we can take $63 times the days off. It's kind of just an average across the country, okay? But some parts of the country it's less, and then obviously, if you're driving a truck in New York City, you get $74 a night. It must be about $15 for the therapy of trying to find a place to park. Okay, you can't imagine driving a tractor trailer in New York City. All right? So that's where those expenses come into play on the 2106, the EZ, okay? Now, the 2106. All right. And there is the ministers. Okay. Much the same at the top. Um, it does have a middle section there. We can see step two, it asks for reimbursements received from your employer that were not reported in box one of your W-2. Include any reimbursements reported under code L in box 12, okay? So if we have something that's an L in box two, so we're gonna do Care Mart, and she gets $750. Okay. Whoop, I forgot one part of the 2106, I'm sorry, okay. Down at the bottom, just like our Schedule C, we have our mileage, so we can compute our miles there, okay? And it has the mileage that is there, all right? If we put box in a box, uh, say for, who is this one, for Grace? She has an L there for $750 that she gets as reimbursement. We do have to carry that over, okay? It doesn't flow over for us, all right? Okay. So those are expenses on a 2106. Now. The other thing that you can do is just list them directly, okay? You don't necessarily have to use that. Typically, the only time I get involved in a 2106 is if I have somebody that is an over-the-road trucker or mileage, okay? Any other expenses, you can just kind of list them, all right? What I mean by that is if I go into my type here, okay, and I go onto there, it says uh, Schedule A line 21 business expense. And I get a nice little chart, okay? Kind of looks like a scratch pad. So if we're on Schedule A and we're in the job expense line 21 where it says type, we hit that, hit F9, Schedule A business expenses, I can just list them there, okay? Typically this is where I would do if I have somebody comes in that works at Delphi and is a nurse. All right, because I'll put in there union dues, okay? Other things that they might deduct are special clothing, all right? I always have a problem with the whole scrub thing because I see everybody wearing scrubs everywhere. <laughs> Typically clothing is if it is something that you do not generally wear in public. And what they did in those scrubs, I don't know if they should be wearing in public, okay? <laughs> that's one of the things that's always bothered me, all right? Okay? Construction worker, if they have to have a reflective vest, a hard helmet, steel-toed shoes, okay? 
uh, some of my border patrol, um, homeland security people that I do, certain things that the government does not pay for, like a higher grade bulletproof vest that they like to buy, which I don't blame them, okay? All right, so those are things that they are required to have to do their job. All right, like I said, you need news. If you're a nurse, sometimes the VNAs do not cover your license. All right, you're doing your license or any other special license that you have to have to do your job. Okay, so those are all in there. A lot of times on a W 2 and box 14, you'll see the words union news, especially on the teachers. Okay. And trust me, people know exactly how much money is taken out of each paycheck for their union dues. If you ask them, they say, oh yeah, $26.13 a week. Like they're accounting for everything that the union's doing, okay? All right, so you can always put that in there. Now, all of these sound great, all right, but they're all going to have to exceed... 2% of my AGI in this section. Okay, so if you're back on the Schedule A and you look down at line 26, there's a 2% number. Somebody has a great union job, and they're paying union dues. It's amazing that the union realizes that 2% is the threshold. Okay, I have, and I go round and round with these people, I have some steam fitters. I do taxes for and the dad is a client and at least he's a little bit more savvy and does the numbers his son came in and sat down across from me and goes my union dues are 2% of my adjusted gross income plus $1,500 <laughs> and I go excuse me he goes yeah my union dues are 2% of my adjusted gross income plus $1,500 I'm going, I'm going to need proof. He goes, well, that's what they told us to say. <laughs> okay, you need to you need to break it up a little bit because you knew exactly what the threshold was so that you could get some money. All right, instead of saying your union dues are $1,800, this guy goes, 2% of my adjusted gross plus $1,500. Okay, can you see the rationale? The kid wasn't real happy, but all right. And then the union has this nice little spreadsheet for all the jobs the steam fitters did. And whatever they are paid for the job, they take 2% and then add this amount to it. So yes, they do. They know exactly what the threshold is, okay? <clears throat> so, but the big thing is to realize when people talk about these unreimbursed expenses, it's always tough, okay? You got a good job and they're reimbursing you for things, but you have some out of pocket. You know, if I'm making $100,000, okay, I'm gonna get over 2%. So it can be very tough. Now, other things that we can add in there besides our business expenses. All right, so we had travel. Okay, we have entertainment. As I said at the bottom of 1220, it talks about the 50% rule. Just remember that is the pizza rule. Each of you gets half of the number of slices, okay? All right. Uh, oh, gift expenses. Okay, this is a good one. All right. Deduction for business related gifts are limited to $25 per person per year. This includes both direct and indirect. Okay. Exceptions to the 25 limit include an item that costs $4 or less. Okay. So, probably going to be one of the problems. All right. I give all of my employees $25. How many of you have gotten a $25 gift card from somebody that you work for? Now you know why. Okay, because if they gave you $30, they can only deduct $25. Why would they give you $30? Unless you did a really good job, okay? Now you're starting to understand some of the numbers why people do what they do to you, huh? So, okay. Isn't that funny? All right. But that's one on there. That's a limit on that. 1223, okay? There is the magic circle for our transportation expenses, okay? So that is where most employees and self-employed persons can use this chart, especially if you have somebody that works a second job, okay? All right, so 
as you can see, we got to kind of start with home. And if you drive back and forth to your regular main job, that is not deductible. If I go for my regular main job to a second job, that is deductible. Okay? If I go for my regular main job to a temporary work location, that is deductible. Who might that apply to? You may think of an instance where if you're going from your regular main job to a temporary work location. So I drive for home, go to my job, and then I'm told to go somewhere. What's that? Yeah. If they're not being, you know, if they're not in a company van where the fuel is paid for and everything like that. Okay. All right. Because then you kind of get cloudy because then they can end up almost being an independent contractor. Okay. All right. So you can kind of see as to where it is. And that's always the best one to use is to use this chart. Say, okay, you went from home, where'd you go? To my main job. All right. After your main job was done, where'd you go? Back home. Not deductible. Okay. Well, actually, I worked the graveyard shift at Tim Hortons. So... Okay, my second job is Tim Horton, so I get that. But for my second job back home, is that deductible? No. So only between my main job and my second job. Because again, the IRS is saying you gotta go home. Okay, funny how they make you live your life a certain way. All right, you gotta eat and you gotta go home. Okay. Well, they don't say anything about sleep. All right. Okay. Uh, record keeping um, is on page 1225. One thing I do for my people is obviously in the day and age of computers, it's much easier. Um, you know, some companies have you, you know, like my wife, it's almost spooky because her company issued tablet. They know where she is every second of the day. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you know, it sets up and it's always hooked to Wi-Fi and, and uh, she pulls up in front of a store that she has to visit and they know when she's there and all of a sudden she'll pull up, look at her tablet and all the information for the store has already started downloading. So, but if somebody doesn't have that instance and they have mileage that they can keep track of, I don't need anything fancy, okay? Basically what I need is a, some type of record keeping, a calendar with where you were if it's not to your main job, okay? We can sit down with Google at the end of the year and figure out all your miles. That's not hard to do. But what we need to know is where you were at and when you were there. Okay? So you don't have to try to get somebody to keep track of, on their odometer that the odometer started out at 89,343, and then when I got there it was 89,433. Okay? I'm not going to drive anybody insane with that because what's going to happen when they get there? They're going to forget to look, and, okay? All right? So the little spiral notebook in the glove compartment, I don't need to worry about, okay? All right? This day and age of computers, and I think there's actually an app somebody told me once that you can use on your phone that'll keep track of your mileage. But, again, you got to remember to turn it on turn it off when you're going places, so, okay? But it'll log miles for you, all right, for record keeping. Uh, we talked on 1226 about reporting when reimbursed. Okay, let's try it on that one. Talk about who must file. Oh, there we go, bottom of 1228. Remember I was talking about when you don't need to use the 2106. Talks about union dues. Another good one, tools. If you have tools that you need to purchase in order to do your job. Sometimes uh, I have uh, mechanics come in uh, wherever they work as a mechanic, they don't get reimbursed for their tools. Well, Mac tools and what's the other ones, the little trucks that snap on, uh, all those tractor, you know, the little trucks that drive around to the mechanics, they've gotten real good. At the end of the year, they'll print out for somebody what they spent with them, okay? So if they're not reimbursed for those tools to use to repair as a mechanic, they have a list for me on that one, Okay. Uh, physical examinations required by the employer. You got to pay for your own drug test. Okay. All right. And I guess this in day and age, it's always a haircut. All right. 
So if you got to go get a little snip of hair done so that you can pass your drug test, okay? Uh, dues to professional organizations, uh, subscriptions to professional magazines, all right? Again, if I'm a lumberjack, my subscriptions to logging is going to be written off. My subscriptions to Cupcakes or Us is probably not going to suffice, okay? All right. Fred's laughing back there. Do you know a lumberjack? Is that why you're laughing? Okay. But, you, you, yeah, you know, kind of, you can't write off something, you know, or People Magazine, you know, if you're just catching up on the gossip or whatever, okay? Uh, passport for business trip. Again, you know, if you have to have that passport, obviously we're in a proximity of another country. So if you have to pay for your own enhanced driver's license to go back and forth across to conduct business, okay? Uh, fees to employment agencies, cost to look for a new job, cost for business use of taxpayers' home. Again, if you have a home office where you're a commuter, you can write that off if you're not reimbursed. But again, we have to get over the 2% threshold, okay? And home office has to be a home office, all right? Can't be half of the toy room in the basement. Can't be a home office that has a bed. I've had people argue, say, I don't think anybody's ever slept in a bed. It's just got papers stacked on it. It's a bedroom. If it's a bed, it's a bedroom, okay? All right. Um, the ones for employment agencies and costs to look for a new job in the taxpayer's current occupation. I'm a tax preparer. I'm no longer working for the company I'm working for, but I'm looking to be a tax preparer somewhere else. So my resume, things like that. What about a new suit to go interview? No, no, okay, all right. Uh, and talked about fees to employment agencies like headhunters to find yourself a job, okay? Certain educational expenses. Um, again, uh, let's see, oh, I'm getting ready to take uh, and renew my state license for health and life insurance, okay? I have to do take a 40 hour class online and I have to pay for it. Esther's not gonna pay for it, okay? She is, but we're just using a free example, okay? So I have to do that and that educational expense to do that online class to get my license would be qualified, okay? If I'm just going to school to try to make myself better, just in a general sense to get myself more education, then you're hard pressed, okay? Question. Yes. For you, you know, being an enrolled agent, mm -hmm. I know every three years you have to take us like 24 or 27 hours of CE. Now that wouldn't be because it's a requirement of. of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Business liability insurance, malpractice insurance. So if you're a doctor, but again, only the premiums that exceed 2%, okay? And cost of teaching aid supplies and equipment, okay? Um, we'll talk about this when we get in. This is where the teachers add things in. Um, we'll talk about this when we get into the uh, adjustments income. Teachers get $250, okay? Just as a blanket, thank you. Well, I don't know why they get it, because if anybody still has kids in school, they give you that supply list. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, you know, I can't think of anything you missed. You know, you got box, and, and especially you walk in the classroom and they open this locker and it's stacked from the bottom to the top with tissue boxes and still the same way at the end of the year. But they get $250, okay? Anything they spend out of their pocket over and above, they can put on this business expense. But it has to do with their, you know, role as a teacher. Best example I have, I have somebody that is a um, music and theater teacher. Her school has a very small budget for the musical. So each year out of her pocket, she buys parts of the costumes and the scenery and stuff like that. It is not reimbursed so that the kids can put on the musical. Obviously that is part of her job and that educational purpose, okay? I forget how many top hats she bought for something one time. But she comes in and we know now that we talk and say, okay, what over $250 did you spend? And depending on how elaborate the scenery is, sometimes she gets to take a little bit on her itemized deductions. Again, has to exceed the 2%, okay? All right, so that's a good, uh, good example of teaching aids, okay? 
Um, it talks about on 1229, talks about work clothes and uniforms must be a condition of employment and not suitable for everyday wear. You know, again, the whole scrub thing, to me it's a gray area, okay? I'm thinking more of things like hard hat, safety glasses, you know. Of course, I guess, you know, you do see quite a few of the landscape guys wearing their neon green shirts everywhere they go, okay? But, you know, that's a safety shirt, okay? So we have that, all right? Okay. All right, so let's take about a five-minute break, and then we'll come back and finish up 12 here, okay? Okay. So we got a little bit more, and we're on page 1234. Uh, talks about work-related education expenses, uh, that it has to meet at least one of the following two tests. The education is required by the employer or the law to keep the taxpayer's present salary status or job. The required education must serve a bona fide business purpose of the employer, or the education maintains or improves skills needed in taxpayers' present work. Okay. Basically, you can kind of see it's required. Okay. It creates a lot of gray area on things like Michelle brought up about, you know, tax preparers and their credentials and things like that. So you really have to kind of run it through the test. However, even if the education meets one or both the above test, it is not qualifying work-related education if it is needed to meet the minimum education requirement of the taxpayer's present trade or business or is part of a program of study that will qualify the tax preparer for a new trade or business. All right, does anybody feel like a dog that just chased their tail? Okay, you know, Basically, like I said, it, you know, it very rarely those education expenses unless it's something that's required, okay? So, so just to use the, the, the we did in PA, mm -hmm. so I studied and took the GAA exam three times. Mm -hmm. That wouldn't be, for me, an education thing because it, that would qualify me for a new, no, that wouldn't be a new trade, would it? Mm -mm. It would just be a new status kind of. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, all right. The example down there says, Jill, a teacher has satisfied the minimum requirements for teaching. So, in New York, she's probably licensed. Her employer requires an additional college course each year for each teacher to keep their teaching job. If the courses will not qualify Jill for a new trade or business, they are qualified work-related education, even if Jill eventually receives a master's degree and an increase in salary, okay? All right, because of this extra education. So you can see where you're kind of creating a little bit of a gray area, all right? Okay. So what about um, some service tests? <laughs> you know those terms, ordinary and necessary? Okay. Yeah, the ordinary and necessary. Uh, next one. Kelly, a sales clerk at a local store, took a tax class at the local college with the hopes of becoming a tax professional. Because this would qualify her to work in a new business, the cost of the course is not deductible. Dorothy, a tax professional, attends a week of seminars dealing with corporate taxes to improve her job skills. The cost of the seminars is deductible. Okay? So, you know, again, you're kind of, you know, that there's a great little thing there that's a one of those charts. And like I said, always say the IRS loves flow charts. You're going to have to ask yourself each of the questions. Okay? And that's a chart that's good, is great to reference. All right? Speaking of tax professionals, you get to deduct your tax preparation fees from the previous year. So whatever you paid. But guess what for you guys? That just went out the door. Because now you're tax professionals and you're not going to charge yourself. If I see that one of you has tax prep fees on your return, that means that you paid yourself to do your return. So... That means I would expect to see a Schedule C for self-employment as a tax preparer 
with no expenses to be able to be deduct because you're not computing from your commuting from your computer. Okay. So, all right. But yes, tax prep. Other expenses that are on there that you see on line 23. Um, it goes on to uh, page 1237. It says certain miscellaneous deductions, again, subject to the 2%. Okay. Um, these expenses must be to produce or collect income that must be included in gross income to manage, conserve, or maintain property held for the producing such income, or to determine, contest, pay, or claim a refund of any tax year. Okay. Here's examples, appraisal fees, to determine uh, the fair market value of something. So if you had to pay somebody from a uh, casualty loss, uh, clerical help or office rental, credit debit card convenience fees for paying taxes. The IRS does not take credit cards, they have a third party. When you go on there, if you wanna pay your, your taxes by credit card, there's usually a $7.50 processing fee plus 2.5% of the balance paid. So I wouldn't really call that a convenience. Okay, all right. At least the post office has started discounting their stamps again, so you can mail it, all right. Custodial fees for investment property, hobby expenses, not to exceed hobby income. Remember we talked about on line 21 where that income would show up? This is where we can put the expenses if we're not materially participating in it. But again, all subject to the 2%. This is the big one everybody always asks about, legal expenses. Incurring, attempting to produce, collect income or a tax refund. The best example is on, if you go to 12, 39, at the bottom, Carrie Dibbs paid her lawyer the following amounts. 4,000 for representing her during her divorce. I don't know why this is in with the divorce, but preparing a new will for $450, and it doesn't say if it was for she or the ex-husband, okay? When I first read that, I'm going, somebody's got a morbid sense of humor. And 2,500 assistance in obtaining alimony. Only the 2,500 is deductible because she spent it attempting to secure taxable income. All right, so everybody see how that legal services, or legal, excuse me, legal expenses worked? It has to be in obtaining taxable income, okay? All right, and then the other big one too is repayments of income, social security, all right, in the safety deposit box. Sometimes, when, um, depending on how somebody's long-term disability and their social security disability works, sometimes you can, um, you have to repay one or the other, and that's where that would come into play, because you get to claim that as an expense, because you're repaying income, okay? All right. Okay. Um, on, uh, let's see here, other miscellaneous deductions not subject to 2%, the biggest one we're gonna see there is remember when we did the W2Gs and we had that little spot that we could put in the losses equal to the winnings? This is where it goes, okay? All right. Um, do, 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 do. If you paid federal estate tax on income in respect of a decedent, so if you're the beneficiary, or excuse me, yeah, beneficiary or executor, all right? Um, the rest of those you don't really see. The big one that always goes on there is the gambling, okay, for the other miscellaneous. All right. <clears throat> on 1239, you can see non-deductible expenses. All right. Adoption expenses. Well, obviously, we can't double dip. If we're gonna get the 13,400, we can't take it on this part. Check writing fees. Anybody here still write checks? Every yeah, every now and then, yeah. So, all right, club dues, fines and penalties. Okay, so obviously if you have to pay a penalty or fine for something. <clears throat> Funeral expenses. Uh, we talked previously, homeowners and renters insurance is not. 
uh, investment-related seminars, non-business license fees, personal use property, uh, professional accreditation fees, um, repairs and improvements on personal residence, and personal legal expenses except those paid to obtain, obtain taxable income, okay? So, if, you know, again, you know, you have uh, paid $450 to a lawyer to prepare the will, that's not deductible, okay? All right, okay, and let's see here, 1241. <clears throat> Believe it or not, there is a limit on itemized deductions, okay? So, you cannot deduct more than $309,900 of itemized deductions. Has anybody in here come close to that? <laughs> Usually everybody's just fighting to get over the standard deduction, much less worried about the other end, okay? However, if you are single, it's only 258,000, okay? All right? Tim's not looking up. He's trying to be discreet. You've, you've run against that, haven't you? No? Okay. All right. Usually when you don't look up, that's a kind of sign of guilt that you got, that your, your experience is $258,000 of itemized. Okay? All right. Okay. Um, I think I mentioned the other day when we were talking about uh, some of the things that, uh, that President-elect Trump's thinking about doing, and one of those things is uh, raising the standard, but then he would lower the limit. Okay, so he's going to kind of close the gap between the two. All right. Okay. And actually helps the middle class and hurts the wealthy. Because, you know, then they would be limited to, what was it, 100,000, I think? Um, yeah, 100,000 married, or 100,000 single, 300,000 married filing joint. But the standard deduction would be raised to 15,000 for single and 30 for married filing joint. Okay, so, and 30,000, that, that's, I very rarely see anybody exceed 30,000 on itemized, unless they have a couple homes, so, okay, all right, all right, so, let's take a look here, and, we're going to take a look. What time is it? Oh, it's okay. <clears throat> All right. Okay. So we're going to do twelve one. Uh, one thing I want to note on there, if you go to page 156, okay, this is not Grace Hodges' W-2, all right? Somewhere else, Grace has ended up over here. So it is Timothy's, okay? So why don't you go ahead and start. We'll get uh, Timothy in there. He's just single security guard, and we'll kind of go through everything that he has on his itemized, okay? So we're going to work on problem 12-1. Um, he did a 1040 last year, okay, and his ex-wife itemized last year on their 2014 return. They received a refund of $2. Timothy just went through a divorce and was finalized in December of the prior year, okay? So what do we need to do with that? Any idea? You can file a single. Yep. What about uh, the fact that she itemized last year? What? What if she itemized this year and they were married filing separate? Then he, would he would have to itemize. Yep. Okay.
you have a text message. Okay. <clears throat> All right, it says he had health insurance the whole year. Okay. Has everybody got his name and the W-2 in? Timothy and his ex-wife itemized last year on the return. They received a refund of $2. So what's he have to do this year? How much? A dollar. A dollar. <laughs> yep. 
I hate to have him audited over a dollar. Okay. Talks about his direct deposit information. We might want to make note, Timothy won a $500 scratch-off ticket in his state's lottery. He had no additional income. All right, so where's that $500 going to go? Line 21. So if we go to our 1040, line 21, we get our little link, takes us to our other income, and it has gambling winnings. We can just put it right on there, okay? We don't have a W2G form, all right? Oop, 500. Okay. So on that one, that uh, that bullet point for the 500 is uh, goes right there on line um, 21, goes into the worksheet there on line one for gambling winnings, okay? All right. Uh, talks about him not being a full-time student. EIC was never disallowed. He had health insurance the whole year. All right, and now he has several questions about his Schedule A. All right, so we're down there at the bottom. First one, real estate taxes. Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. Yep, okay. He must have got the house in the divorce, I take it. Okay. And he's paying the taxes, right? Okay. So real estate taxes, we're going to go to our Schedule A. In line six, there's real estate taxes on your principal residence. Okay. All right. And we had some mortgage interest, yes or no? Yes. Okay. So down a little farther on our Schedule A, interest paid, line 10 of the Schedule A. We have a spot that talks about mortgage interest and points from our Form 1098. We don't have that, but we can put it right there. Cash donations to church. Yes or no? Okay. So we can go in our gifts to charity and get our little detail worksheet. All right. And we go on to our cash contributions, and we can put church. Okay, 260. All right, so everybody tell me when they got the first three in, okay? Anybody? Raise your hand. Yes. If it's in uh, 14, <clears throat> what do we think? No, 14 won't carry over. <clears throat> Says he has receipts for everything. <clears throat> so what do we think, yes or no? It's kind of an odd amount. That's why it's kind of probably throwing you off. You guys are thinking, well, it's not like the 104 where it's $2 a week for the uh, United Way. What some people will do is um, through the United Way for a specific charity, they'll have a percentage of their income taken out. So in this case, yes, okay? Their payroll person will cut a check to the charity on a monthly basis, and it kind of goes in there anonymous to the charity. So in this case, yes, you can, okay? Can we still put it on the box 14 on the W-2? Yes, but you have to put it then under cash contributions, is that what you were asking? And that amount was, how much was that? $532.81. Okay. All right. We still put that on the W-2, we should answer. Go both spots, yep, both spots, yep. Always want to recreate the W-2 the best you can, okay? It's just the fact that box 14 won't carry anywhere. All right, okay. All right, and we have...
Work uniforms, yay or nay? When it says work uniforms, we'll probably have to say yes, okay? So on our Schedule A, um, let's see. We're gonna do a 2106 for him. Easy, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, first thing we have is work uniforms. All right. I'm going to show you the way. Is uh, everybody on their 2106 easy? Okay. See line four where it says business expenses not included in lines one through three? One through three mostly have to do with our transportation, things like that, correct? Okay. That one's kind of a catch-all. This is a prime spot if you're going to use a 2106 for a scratch pad, okay? So if I go in there to the link, what's my only option? Scratch pad, isn't it? Okay. So you can open that. There's that scratch pad, okay? So on the first one I'm gonna put is work uniforms. If I can spell it. All right, he had $75. Uh, union dues, yay or nay? Yes. yes, okay. So next one down I can put union dues. Pretty cheap union, okay. All right, professional publications. Fred, is this a loggers magazine or a cupcake magazine? Okay, all right, okay, all right. Okay, so yes on that one, I take it, as long as they're for his job. Okay, all right, and then our next one down, tax prepped, okay? So when we're done with our little scratch pad, we can go back to the tree on the left, hit our Schedule A, and go down. All right. Line 22 of our Schedule A, tax prep fees, $152, okay. What about a safety deposit box? Yes. Yes, okay. So on line 23, you can see other expenses. It does give you the example of safety deposit box. If you go under type, hit an F9, you get a little miscellaneous deduction worksheet, and you can put those right on there, okay? So we have safe deposit box. Cheap safe deposit box, okay. Gambling losses, yes, where? Is it subject to the 2% or not subject? Does anybody remember? Not subject. So where's it gonna go on our Schedule A? Okay, all the way down to other, isn't it? Line 28. And actually there's a clue there, see in the red, what's it say? And W-2 losses add in here, okay? But we don't have a W-2G, so I'm gonna go to my type. I'm gonna hit F9. I have other deductions, Schedule A line 28 deductions, okay? Now, this one is very quirky when it comes to e-filing. You have to use the term gambling losses. If you put losses on gambling, it'll reject, re, re, reject it for e-filing. I don't know why, it's the same thing, but do put gambling losses, okay? All right, and he had $720. So what do we put in? What was that, Tim? Y500. 
Remember, you can only write off losses up to equal your winnings. All right, good catch, Tim. All right, so 500, okay? Legal fees for his divorce. Doesn't say that it generate any income or alimony, does it? And the fact that he has no alimony on his tax return, I'm guessing he footed the bill for the both of them and she's getting the alimony. You cannot take it if you're generating income for somebody else, okay? You have to generate income for yourself on your return, all right? I had somebody argue that with me one time. He says, I generated income for her. I'm like, no, I understand your perspective. Good point, but has to be on your return, okay? So legal fees for the divorce, no. Required training for being security guard, unreimbursed. Yes, okay. So what we're going to do is, remember our 2106? If you look on the tree on the left, the 2106EZ, we got a little scratch pad, don't we? So click right on that scratch pad, it should bring it back open for you. And then you can put on there, training. Okay, and his training was $400, all right? And like I said to you, try to use your tree to, to navigate, unless you wanna get used to going all the way back to the schedule A, and then going down and stuff like that. You know, you can see over there that you know that scratch pad is under that 2106EZ, okay? Mileage for training in August. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Since it had to do with his training, it's his travel expenses. So we're going to go to the 2106 EZ. And we're going to go down. Part two says information. So he had business miles. All right. What did he have? 260. Okay. All right. Okay. Now, what I want you to notice on this one is you always have to watch this on these little things. When you put that 260 in, okay, on this one, it does carry up for you, okay? Remember on the other easy form for uh, self-employment that we'll talk about again? It didn't carry up. So you always have to be careful. And then, to throw you a curve, on a Schedule C, it doesn't carry up unless you check the little box. Okay, so there's no consistency, but you have to know where it should go. And in this case, the 260 miles at 57 and a half cents popped up there at the top. Okay. All right. Uh, tolls for work. Tolls and parking, and uh, he had there. What do you think? Tolls for work expenses while in training away from home. Why would you think they would say that? Yeah, away from home, okay? So, does that count? Yep, so we got $30 between parking and tolls. If we look at our 2106, line two, says parking fees and tolls. So we got $30 in there, okay? And then the next one says overnight lodging. Work expenses while in training away from home. Okay. All right. Now, either he stayed more than one night or they're putting him up at the Ritz. But he has $280. Okay. All right. Okay. And that's all he has on there. Okay. And then don't forget to answer your little questions about his car. It was his car. He does not have a spouse. Remember, he's divorced. He does have written support. You know what it said? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So when it's all said and done on our Schedule A, if you want to go back to it, we didn't have any medical, did we, on this one? Nope. Okay. So Mm -hmm. Shouldn't that thirty show up? Mm-hmm. Did you put thirty dollars in there? 
Mm-hmm. Where did you put it? Well, probably better to go right there with on the line designation. Because that scratch pad we're really using for a summary for our line four, so we know what's in there on it. Okay. Lodging has its own line, yes. Okay. Uh, so Schedule A, if you want to go back there, taxes paid. I have 4183. How's that? Everybody same page? So Schedule A, line 9, 4183. Uh, let's see, we have interest paid on line 15, 69.84. Uh, gifts to charity, $793. Okay. And line 27 should read $819. Okay. So you can kind of see how all those things work, but what did he have to do? He had to exceed 2%, $785, before $1 would count. Everybody see the calculation down there? That's why sometimes, you know, with these things, you know, unless, and this is a pretty extensive list of somebody having training and, and uh, job expenses, things like that. Sometimes it's very tough to get to that 819, okay? And then down below, other deductions, we should have gambling losses. So our total itemized should be 13,279. Yes. Um for the lodging, somewhere in the that wasn't 2106. Right, yeah. Line 3, travel expenses away from home. $280. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. <clears throat> okay. So you can see there's usually a lot of work involved with these job expenses, but if you if you ask somebody and said, okay, you're making 50,000, did you have more than $1,000 expenses between job, their tax prep, and any other investment things? They're gonna look at you, no way. You know, so it, it's a very hard threshold to get over. Okay. So looks like we have a refund of 230, on the federal and he owes the state 180. Okay. Uh, 